There's nothing in baseball that I love more than a rookie taking center stage like a professional. We've seen some awesome first year performances over the last few seasons, but something important to remember with rookies is that the league can figure them out pretty quick. One day they'll be dominating and the next they may be demoted. It's what makes baseball really special. There are so many variables to every game and one hot streak or good month could just be a flash in the pan. For six players we're talking about today, their rookie seasons were by far the best of their career. I think one of the hardest things Things to do in MLB is come up and immediately make an impact, which is what makes these six guys so special. So today we're going to talk about MLB's forgotten rookie sensations. If you remember these guys or think I left out anybody that was deserving to be on the list, make sure you leave a comment down below and like the video and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed today's video. All right, let's get into it. Casey McGeehee was a 10th round pick for the Chicago Cubs in 2003 and spent six years in the minor leagues before finally getting a crack in Chicago in 2009. But after just 25 plate appearances, he was unceremoniously cut and picked up on waivers by the division rival Milwaukee Brewers. McGeehee shifted from first base to second base to third base in the infield while filling in for injuries during his start in Milwaukee. In his first two months, he had just 45 plate appearances and batted 240. It wasn't until June that he'd settle into one position and begin mashing the ball. He batted 368 with five home runs and a 196 OPS plus in June, but somehow lost in National League Rookie of the Month voting to Tommy Hansen of the Braves, who went 4-0 in five starts with a 2.48 ERA. Still, Casey McGee's June propelled him to an impressive second half for the Brew Crew. In 63 second half games, McGeehee clubbed 10 home runs with an 811 OPS, deeming him a mainstay bat in their lineup for many years to come. He joined Milwaukee's wild ride to the NLCS in 2011, where he collected 103 RBIs in the regular season. He played in the bigs for six more seasons with teams like the Miami Marlins, Pittsburgh Pirates, San Francisco Giants, New York Yankees, and Detroit Tigers, before heading to Japan and eventually retiring. Jared Parker was a highly touted prospect for the Arizona Diamondbacks, who drafted him with the ninth overall pick in 2007. After getting Tommy John surgery in 2009, he'd make it to the big leagues in 2011, just in time for September. He made only one start that season, hurling five and two thirds scoreless innings, and even made the postseason roster pitching in the NLDS against the Brewers. While eventful, his tenure in Arizona was short lived, as he'd be flipped to Oakland in a deal sending Trevor Cahill to the Diamondbacks. Early on, though, it looked as though Oakland fleeced Arizona. In this deal, as Parker would have a remarkably good rookie season. In his first full season, he'd record quality starts in each of his first four outings after being added to the rotation at the end of April in 2012. In his first start in June, he'd no-hit the Rangers through seven innings. He'd maintain a 2.96 ERA in 14 first-half starts, declaring him the de facto ace of the ragtag athletic staff that featured Tommy Malone, Travis Blackley, AJ Griffin, Brandon McCarthy, and of course, Bartolo Colon. Parker and the staff were solid in the second half as well, good enough for the team to go 94-68 and 68 and win the AL West. In his rookie season, Jared Parker got the nod for Game 1 and Game 5 of the ALDS, both matching him up with Justin Verlander of the Tigers. Though the A's failed to get him the win either time, the future looked bright for Parker. He'd pitched to a 3.97 ERA in 32 starts in 2012, but would undergo a second Tommy John surgery in the offseason headed into 2013. He wouldn't be able to rebound from this, fracturing his elbow twice in ensuing seasons, and he'd never throw another big league pitch. Garrett Jones was originally a 14th round pick in 1999, and his journey through the minors was difficult to say the least. After a brief 30 game stint with the Twins in 2007, Garrett Jones toiled in the minors for the 2008 season before being released. He signed a minors deal with Pittsburgh and put forth low expectations, but after slugging over 500 and 300 plate appearances, the Pirates gave him the call. Garrett Jones made noise immediately by hitting 10 home runs in his first month as a Pirate, slugging over 700 and putting up an OPS above 1,000. This included a four-game stretch against the Phillies and Giants where Jones went 6 for 17 with five home runs, despite the Pirates winning just one of those games. He was named the National League Rookie of the Month for July in 2009, and rightfully so. Jones became the first to hit seven home runs in his first 12 games with the Pirates since Dino Rustelli in the 1949 season. He'd finish seventh in that year's National League Rookie of the Year voting with a slight disadvantage from only playing half the season. He lost out to the likes of Chris Coughlin, J.A. Happ, teammate Andrew McCutcheon, and division rival Casey McGeehy, who we talked about before. He'd assume the role of everyday player from 2010 to 2013 for the Pirates, splitting time between first base and the outfield while being one of the most reliable left-handed bats in their lineup. In his final season in Pittsburgh, the Pirates finally reached the postseason after 20 consecutive losing seasons. 
Jaime Garcia had an improbable journey to the bigs, being drafted in the 22nd round of the 2005 draft by St. Louis. Of the late round draft picks who signed with their team that year, only Tyler Flowers and Sergio Romo were drafted later and went on to become major league regulars. After spending time in the minor leagues for five years with one brief big league stint in 2008, Jaime Garcia was named the number five starter for the Cardinals in 2010, edging out Rich Hill. Garcia would make his presence known immediately, starting his rotation career with a 1.04 ERA in his first four starts. He'd turn in 14 consecutive quality starts in the first half. He'd have a 2.17 ERA in 17 first half starts, but somehow not make the all-star team in the National League. Just three of his 28 starts in 2010 would not be quality starts, in fact, and he'd record his first complete game shutout in the second half against the Giants in August. He'd place third in National League Rookie of the Year voting in 2010, being edged out by two great rookie campaigns from Jason Hayward and Buster Posey. By next season, Garcia would be the number three starter. He'd also record five postseason starts, including 10 innings with only two earned runs allowed in the World Series that the Cardinals would win against the Rangers. Jaime Garcia had arguably the most successful career of anyone on this list, including 147 games started with a 3.57 ERA for the Cardinals over eight years. His MLB career would be 10 seasons long, and he'd play for five different teams between 2017 and 2018, but for a while there, he was one of the best lefties in the game. Brennan Bosch was a third round pick in 2006 and was decently ranked in the Tigers farm system ahead of his 2010 big league debut. Bosch was extremely hot when he came up in April, with his first homer coming in a sixth game, a grand slam against the Angels that would make the difference in a 10-6 win. He'd keep things sharp in May, batting 345 with three home runs and a 952 OPS. June was even better clubbing eight home runs and 13 extra base hits total. By the end of the first half, Bosch had all-star consideration with an impressive line for a rookie that included a 167 OPS plus and 12 home runs and 267 plate appearances. Bosch was named the American League Rookie of the Month for May and June in 2010 and Tigers Player of the Month in June. In his rookie season, Bosch topped all American League rookies with 14 home runs and 67 RBIs, and he'd finished fifth in American League Rookie of the Year voting. Unfortunately for Bosch, a terrible second half detained deteriorated his monster numbers from the first half. From July to September, Bosch batted just 163 with an OPS plus of 28. He battled minor injuries as his playing time dwindled, though he'd improve in 2011. He started the next season strong, leading the AL in June with 41 hits and a 380 batting average, but his season ended prematurely when he suffered a torn ligament in his hand in August. It was the first time in his career that he'd been sidelined by a serious injury, and it would plague him for the rest of his career. In 15 total seasons in the Nippon Baseball League, Hideki Okajima pitched to a 3.18 ERA in 546 games, with two of those seasons coming after his stint in MLB. He turned his reliable Japanese performance into a two-year deal worth $2.5 million with the Boston Red Sox in 2007. His big league career started out as bad as you can imagine, believe it or not. Okajima allowed a home run to John Buck on his very first pitch in MLB. It was the 11th time in MLB history that a pitcher gave up a home run on his very first pitch. However, Okajima shut things down after that with 19 consecutive scoreless appearances across two months, compiling 20 shutout innings with 22 strikeouts. Okajima edged out Roy Halladay, Pat Neshek, Jeremy Bonderman, and Kelvin Mascabar to win the American League final vote competition, earning him an all-star team nod in his very first season. He joined Mike Lowell, David Ortiz, Jonathan Papelbon, Josh Beckett, and Manny Ramirez as one of Boston's six all-stars from 2007. Okajima's first season would also take place during Boston's second World Series series run in four years, where they swept the Rockies in the Fall Classic. Between the ALDS and ALCS, Okajima would compile seven and a third shutout innings of relief over five appearances. It was his performance in Game 2 of the World Series that really turned heads, where he pitched two and a third perfect innings in relief of Kurt Schilling, striking out four at Fenway Park. He became the first Japanese-born pitcher to play in the World Series, and by proxy, the first to win a ring as well. And that's going to do it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed my picks, and if there's anybody you think I left out that deserved to be on the list, make sure you leave a comment down below. There's definitely enough players to do a part two of this video, so if that's something you're interested, comment for that as well. As always, if you enjoyed today's video, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to the channel, and make sure to ring the bell for all future notifications on my videos. There are some really exciting things going on with me at John Boy Media, and I cannot wait to share them with you all. But until then, I'm the Jolly Olive, and I'll see you guys next time.